Just because I don't want to talk too loud. OK. Hello, everyone, and welcome to phylloseminar.org, a project supported by the Society of Systematic Biologists. Today is the 50th Phyllo Seminar, and I'd like to thank everyone who has participated, especially our 50 fantastic speakers. The next three talks are going to be about phylogenetic approaches to genetic conservation, or as Arnie decided, phylogenetic conservation. Arnie helped uh, organize this trio of talks and selected our distinguished collections of speakers, which includes Catherine Graham and Sandrine Pavlon. Arna is going to be speaking first and will give an opinionated overview. Arna has consistently made important contributions to macroevolutionary thinking, but more importantly, has consistently worked to apply that thinking more broadly. This includes contributions from understanding climate shifts to identifying species that are very important for diversity, yet are teetering on the brink of extinction. On a personal note, uh, Arna is one of the first evolutionary biologists I talked to in my transition from math, and I'm very grateful to him for his warm welcome into the field. Arna has been a professor in British Columbia, first at UBC and now SFU for it. Several decades, has published a long list of papers and mentored many students, including Rutger Bos. Welcome, Arna, and I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. So um, you, everyone can see me that's supposed to see me at this point? Yes. OK, so now I should do a screen share and just start. Is that correct? Sure. OK, so my face is leaving. I turn this on. I turn this on. I turn that on. And I turn that on. So now, does everybody see the first slide, which is in black with my name in big uh, yes. letters. Looks thank lovely. you. Very much. All right. OK. So um, first of all, Eric, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to do this. This is the first um, webinar I've ever given in my life. So I cleverly asked a few of my grad students to come. So there's three or four, and postdocs, so there's three or four other people in the room here. So I don't feel like I'm just talking to my screen. Um, and so Eric said I was going to give an opinionated approach. Um, I don't know about that. It's certainly going to be idiosyncratic. Uh, now, on this title slide here, you'll, I hope everyone sees my mouse. I sh I'll try not to move it around too much. Um, I've listed a long uh, a set of names of people who have helped me. This is kind of a kind of a review talk, um, and I hi highlight two: uh, Dan Faith. A lot of this is just uh, me channeling Dan Faith, really, and Dave Redding, who was a former PhD student of mine. Um, and you'll see a picture of him later. He's at uh, UCL now. So though, but there's lot, many other people in there that have done uh, lots of work, so I don't take any credit, really. Um, this has been supported by the Canadian government, of course, and by the uh, SDIV working group um, out of Leipzig. And some money was given to, by the Systematics Association uh, to Dave, so he could come over here to visit. OK, let's just dive right in. I've got something like 100 slides. So. The basic premise of these three talks in this series and um, what's behind the work that I've been doing for the past decade um, is summed up in this quote from Dan Faith from his 1992 paper, um, which is well cited. And I put the whole quote up because I think it's quite important. So I'll let people read it. And I highlighted maximum underlying feature diversity. And the idea being is that something about phylogenetics captures feature diversity. And if conservation biologists are interested in, in conserving feature diversity, then perhaps they should look to phylogenies. Now, the basic metric that Dan Faith produced is the following. It's called phylogenetic diversity. We call it PD. And as most of you um, will know, it's simply the sum across of the edge lengths, which we denote by lambda, of all the edges that contribute to some subset of a tree or the entire tree, which we uh, I'll be using capital S. So if you have this tree below, which has uh, five species, and we have a subset uh, of those five, A, B, and E, which are colored uh, bluish there, then if you count all the edges that, that are on, in the subtree connecting those three species, species, then hopefully the um, 
total PD, if I've done the arithmetic properly, is 10 units. So the PD of that subset is 10 units, 2 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 4. OK, that's the basic premise. This whole talk looks like this, because it's putting the cart before uh, the horse. And that's because the t this talk is really about how uh, we might do that, rather than why we might do this. Uh, can I stop right now and ask, uh, Eric, are you seeing this thing down here that says Google Plus Hangouts is sharing your screen? Nope. I okay. just see, and these are not resolved. OK. So I'm, I, I'll I, have I, you interrupted. I just wanted to remind folks that uh, they should feel free to ask questions using the Q&A app. If you don't know how to use that, you can look for it on Google. Thanks. All right. And that's, that's why this is a sort of cart before the horse talk, but I'll come back to that. So actually, the central question, the, the why question, of course, is why do we want to conserve feature diversity? And I think this is relevant um, to our discussion. And I think there are three main reasons, or at least three that I see in the literature. Um, the first, and I think this is the most common reason given when I go to talks and people speak loosely of phylogenetic diversity and why it might be important, is that the more PD or more of the tree that we can serve, the more raw material we have for future evolution. So it's not about present, it's about the future. It gives us uh, uh, avenues for future evolution. Um, that has been formalized for genetic diversity within species, but I don't think it's been formalized um, for genetic diversity among species where PD is actually used most often. So it's a common, it's a common reason, but I don't think it's, uh, it's been well justified yet. The second main reason is because PD predicts current PD in a place actually predicts ecosystem function. Now, if I, I just put a parenthesis here and turn to the work of this um, handsome man, Mark Kadot, who works at the University of Toronto, and he's taking that, taken that um, supposition or that argument seriously. And in a series of papers, uh, he has shown, I've just listed three here, um, that PD is, in fact, a good predictor of one aspect of ecosystem function, and that is um, biomass of a bunch of plants. So this is um, David Tillman's Cedar Creek plots, where, where over many years, Tillman and his, and his students and colleagues have planted out different numbers of species um, in different combinations, then gone, come back at the end of the season and ask, well, how much green stuff is there? And of course, uh, generally speaking, the more species you have, the more productivity you have. Um, Mark showed that, in fact, if you take the species that are in that plot, build a phylogenetic tree, measure the PD, PD is a, actually a better predictor, a vastly better predictor of productivity than many other ways of measuring those species, even including species richness. Um, he repeated that um, across 29 global experiments, and he found the, the same thing, that PD was a, a much better predictor of productivity. Um, and he even did some especially designed experiments um, just outside of Toronto um, where he seeded plots with the same number of species but varying amounts of PD and found that PD was an independent predictor of productivity. And there's some other um, uh, papers that have come to uh, similar conclusions. And indeed, just to close this uh, parenthesis, um, in a many authored review paper in 2012 in Nature, um, Cardinali et al. actually suggested um, that there is an emerging trend in biodiversity studies, which, which they summed up um, with this quote, that the ecological consequences of biodiversity loss, which is the flip side of adding more PD, can be predicted from evolutionary history. So this is a, a, an area of active research and um, something that I look forward to hearing more about from ecologists. The third reason why we might want to conserve feature diversity, and here I remember I'm using PD, well, I'm now using PD now as a predictor of feature diversity, where even though I haven't said that that is true, um, is that because PD actually measures option value. And option value comes from um, economics. And the way that Dan Faith uh, uh, stated it back in 92, is, if I to paraphrase, is that sets of species representing more PD uh, actually have higher option value because they are more likely to embody features not found elsewhere. And so if we lose those species and decrease the PD, um, we actually lose those features forever. And those features, we may not know why they're uh, important now, but they may be important uh, in the future. Now, 
those are the three reasons why we might want to preserve feature diversity and therefore perhaps use PD as a measure of feature diversity. OK, so with that introduction, the rest of the talk now is just going to be, uh, as I said, idios idiosyncratic look at, at um, some of these things. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, PD. I'm going to introduce something called expected PD. And then I'm going to introduce something called PD complementarity. Uh, these may be well known to some of you, um, but this is just a, sort of a review. Then I'm going to uh, drop in something called evolutionary isolation, which seems to be gaining traction and is somehow linked to PD and expected PD. And then I'm going to say that we don't actually know how it's linked, and therefore we should do some more work. OK. So back to PD. So there's PD of some subset. And the original goal was one of optimization, the idea being that we should try to preserve as much PD as we can, so max PD, given some particular constraints. For instance, if we only uh, can choose k of our n tips, um, which k, which of which Remember, which tip should be in that subset k. So for k equals 3, just by inspection on this tree, we would definitely choose a, d, and e, because that is the subset of 3 that gives us the most pd, the largest sum of the edge lengths on this um, additive tree. So that k of n problem is actually uh, easy and greedy. It's not a hard problem at all. And Mike Steele and Party and Goldman have shown that um, over a decade ago. However, that's not usually not what we do. Usually, we're confronted with the problem that the sets are not, you can't choose any k, that the sets have already been defined. Um, perhaps because where species, where species live um, is not up to us. And where we can put conservation areas, for instance, is also not up to us. So if we have. Uh, species A, B, C, D, and E, these are their ranges, and these are potential conservation areas. And we want to say, well, which one should we choose? We've got um, then a set of S, possible S's that have been given to us. So we can have uh, set A, D, or set A, B, C, or set C, E, because that's where the species are. And it turns out that if we only can choose one set, then the maximum PD is actually this one. But if we want to choose two sets, or if we're allowed to choose two sets because we have enough money for that, then actually the optimum is this one and this one. So a greedy algorithm actually won't work when the sets are predefined. The problems are uh, hard in math speak. And again, Steele and colleagues um, have proven that. Now, this k of n problem, where we say we're only allowed to choose uh, k uh, tips um, out of our n total tips um, can actually be recast using the idea of expected PD. So expected PD generally is the sum of all the edges that are in a tree, just generally now, this is not a subset, this is the whole tree, where each edge is weighted by the probability that it will persist, that it's in your set. So we can use probability of extinction as a way of, of uh, sort of representing whether it's the, the probability that it's in your particular set. So that's the probability that a particular edge will go extinct is the probability that an edge will go extinct or all of the leaves that ultimately subtend that edge will go extinct. So the probability, which is just sort of the, the product of, of those probabilities, um, and so the probability that it's around is just 1 minus that. And so if you multiply that by uh, the length of the edge and you sum it over all edges, that gives you PD, expected PD. So in other words, we can think of this as being uh, a fictitious tree where each edge is weighted by its probability of being around. And so for the K of N problem, we can simply assign probability of extinction of 0 to leaves that are in a particular set and probability of extinction of 1 to leaves that are not in the set. So we can actually do the K of N problem um, using this formulation. And this also has been around um, for quite some time. Vidig and Lushka first presented this sort of framework way back in 1995. So what do we do? Well, there's the formula again. If we have probabilities of extinction for each one of uh, the tips or each one of the leaves, and we have edge lengths, 
then for each tip uh, or each edge here, we can simply take the probability that it'll be around one minus the probability of extinction. So one minus 0.9 is 0.1. Multiply that by the length of the edge, and that'll actually give us this fictitious edge length. This is the expected amount of edge length um, that we expect to see under this scenario. And we can do the same for internal edges as well by simply multiplying the two probabilities of extinction together and then taking one minus that and multiplying that by the edge length. And so the expected PD from, of this tree with these probabilities of extinction, if you're following my mouse up here at the top, um, is this long number here, 5.68. That is an expected PD tree. So it's just the sum of the edge lengths, each one of them weighted by the probability that it'll be around. And so you can ask questions like, well, if you've got some money and you could somehow magically go in and have the extinction probability for any, for any single tip, which one would it be? Right? And that's a, sort of, uh, that, that's a, a reasonable sort of um, armchair uh, experiment. And so we can go through and say, well, if we have the extinction probability of E from 0.6 to 0.3, then its, then its probability of persistence goes up to 1 minus 0 0.3 to 0.7. And so you can simply multiply 0.7, right, which is, which is the new probability of extinction, um, by 4, uh, 1 minus that. And that is your gain. So this little bit here, then, is what you would get if you looked at and tried to conserve or put your money into species E. And you can compare that with, for instance, uh, species A. And it turns out that if you do that, it's better to put your money into A than it is into E. And the reason for that is, if you can conserve E by lowering its extinction probability, that actually conserves not only the branch leading to A, but also these internal branches. So even if B and C go extinct, these internal branches are uh, saved, represented by species A. And so you can see that you can do these sorts of calculations um, to find out for any given amount of money and how many species you want to save, what your optimal allocation might be. And that, in fact, is called the Noah's Ark problem. So um, that was coined by uh, Weizmann, who's an economist. Um, and the idea here is that you simply try to maximize the expected PD by changing the probabilities of extinction of leaves, as I said, for instance, by having one or by having two. Um, however, because the, and the reason it's called the Noah's Ark problem, that there's a constraint that your boat is only so large. And so you have costs and a budget. And so within the specified costs, then what is the optimal uh, changes you can make to the extinction probabilities in order to maximize PD? That is the um, formulation. And generally, this is a hard problem. So this is very much the same as before, except that you get to change the extinction probabilities of certain species, and you ask, which one should I change? That's, the, that's this little symbol up here, if you're following my mouse, um, such uh, so as to maximize the expected PD. And you do this within some sort of some cost that when you use it all up, you have a certain budget, so you, can, you can't go above that budget when you're, when you're trying to change these prob the probabilities of extinction. And again, this is generally not an easy problem. Um, to solve. But there's been recent work showing how to make it easier with linear, linear programming and things like that. OK. So that's how expected PD is used, at least uh, from an armchair point of view. So we have PD, which is the sum of the edge lengths. We have expected PD, which is some of the edge lengths that are weighted by, by some probability. And then the third thing I wanted to introduce was uh, PD complementarity. And that is just a leaf. I should have said tip here. Tip I've been using the word tip, tip and leaf is the same thing, but a, a leaf's contribution to some measure of PD. So PD complementarity of some species X, PD comp X, is simply equal to the PD of the tree that has X minus the PD of the tree that doesn't have X. So you calculate the PD of the, of the tree or some set, which could be an S, um, and then you remove a particular tip and you ask, well, how much does the PD go down? And that difference is the complementarity, how much that species contributes. So again, here in the simple tree, 
um, and for pure PD complementarity, this is actually just the length of this edge. It's the pendant edge length for the whole tree. So the PD complementarity of A on this whole tree is just two. You took it away, your PD drops by two because you lose that whole edge. So it's just called the pendant edge length or PE. So I'm gonna use PE now um, further along the line. Just think of that as being that number there, that amount of PD. Uh, and this works for rooted trees and unrooted trees. Those are little things you have to do, but it's not, it's not a big deal. Okay, so this framework has been around. I think most of the, things, most of the papers I cited are from uh, the 90s, and, and the whole idea of, of conserving the tree is from 91, and Faith's paper is from 92, and all of a sudden, this thing, evolutionary isolation, sort of drops into the middle of the discussion. And so I think now I'm gonna take some time to describe evolutionary isolation as I understand it. And some people out there who might be watching this may have a completely different understanding. So evolutionary isolation is a general term. It's the most general term I can think of describing a particular leaf or particular tips position in some tree. Now it can be in the true tree or it can be in some sort of fictitious tree like the expected uh, PD tree. So it describes the leaf's position such that leaves or tips that have few cl close relatives are isolated, are more isolated. So E is more isolated on this tree than for instance C or D because it has fewer close relatives, right? It is, and the word isolation I think captures um, that general idea. It is isolated on the tree. And as you might expect, isolated species, so defined, are generally thought to exhibit some form of PD complementarity, i.e. they contribute more to the tree than do species that are not isolated or less isolated. So PD complementarity, which trivially is just the uh, pendant edge, the longer your pendant edge, the more isolated you are, and therefore the more you contribute. Okay, so this is one of my favorite uh, isolated species. This is the Hoatzin, who lives in, this is a baby one, lives in um, South America. Uh, the, baby, the babies, as you see, have little claws on their wings so they can climb out of the water when they fall into the water. And, in uh, South America, it has no close relatives, um, and it's a ruminant bird, so it's very uh, different from all other birds because it ruminates. Okay, now remember I said that PD complement complementarity is the contribution of a species to some tree. It could be a real, it could be a, it could be any number of trees. So now I'm going to get now. I'm going to ask the question because, and this will become uh, relevant in about five minutes. Um, the following question: Could we calculate A's contribution, A's complement, not to the whole tree, but to all possible subsets on this particular rooted tree? So, it turns out there are eight possible subsets. Uh, there's the one where it, where A is the only contributor, and if A is the only contributor on this rooted tree that stops here then its contribution on, is one, two, three. It contributes three units to that subset. If that's the tree, it only contributes one unit. If this is the tree, it, only, it actually contributes two units. If this is the tree, it contributes three units again. And we can go through all of the rest, and for all possible uh, subsets that it is a member of, you can calculate its contribution. So, that, so and some average of that could be a, mem a measure of PD complementarity. But what sort of average? Well, this man, Lloyd Shapley, who, who won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2012, actually thought about this in a game theory context back in 1953. And Hawke et al. Uh, realized that they could use that game theory um, organization of complementarity and apply it to phylogenetic trees. And so the Shapley value of a particular species is the PD complementarity, so PD of, that, of, a, of a set minus PD of that same set minus that, spe that focal species that we're looking at, the PD complementarity of a particular species to all possible subsets, weighted in a particular way. And we'll get back to this weighting 
uh, in just a moment. So this is a measure of PD complementarity. It's not the PD complementarity of the species to the entire tree, but to all possible subsets. The original formulation by Hawk et al. in 2005 um, on archive was for unrooted trees, but uh, since then it can be, it's been shown that it, you can apply it to rooted trees or indeed to any set of splits, uh, for instance, on a uh, network. So this works not only for trees, but also for networks from which you can uh, draw splits. Math is pretty much the same. Now, the reason I tell you this is because in parallel, remember I said evolution, evolutionary isolation kind of dropped out of nowhere. Uh, Dave Redding, who um, is a Brit who is do, doing his master's at the University of East Anglia, came up with a bunch of measures of evolutionary isolation completely independently of this idea of PD complementarity. And the one that most people have focused on is something called fair proportion. So fair proportion, this is the, um, uh, this is the way that it's represented, is you simply, again, take all the length of all the edges, and for each edge that connects that, uh, that species to the root, uh, you divide it by the number of species that share that edge. So it's the sum of all the edge lengths, each edge length um, divided or diminished um, by the number of species that share that edge. Um, so this, this uh, metric, very simple metric to calculate, uh, Dave came up with um, for his master's back in the early 2000s. Um, it was independently derived and used by Isaac et al. and um, has been studied by others um, since then. Now, interestingly, um, as you might expect, because, because the pendant edge you only share with yourself, it isn't, it isn't um, weighted by anything, it isn't divided by anything, that fair proportion is weighted towards the local tree shape and is very strongly correlated on average with PE, remember, pendant edge, that simple PE, uh, PD complementarity. And indeed, as you move closer to the root, as trees get bigger and bigger, the increment that you add from those deeper branches is very, very tiny. So it quickly asymptotes, which suggests that you could actually use this um, metric um, for different independent trees. Uh, for instance, you could compare FP values for mammals with FP values for birds or with uh, angiosperms or conifers on average. But the reason that I've uh, 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 focused on this particular measure is because the fair proportion is exactly the same as the Shapley value. And this has been studied now uh, by Klaus Hartmann um, in his PhD thesis and then published and then also by um, other groups to have proven mathematically that the fair proportion value, which is this very simple thing to measure, is exactly the same as the Shapley value. And the reason that's interesting is the EDGE program run out of the Zoological uh, uh, Society of London and the London Zoo uses this metric. So evolutionarily distinct, that's what they call it, uh, and globally endangered, that program, there it is, EDGE birds, um, actually uses this particular metric. So this is a metric that's actually being used for conservation. Now, if we go back and look at this, remember that that measure is the Shapley measure of complementarity. That Shapley measure of complementarity, so there's the complementarity part of it, but then there's this other thing, which is the averaging, to get the average. Remember I said that it was, we would get all possible sets and take some sort of average. Well, this is actually average over all equally weighted subset sizes. And that means to get the average, we actually weight this group and this group three times higher than we weight these particular groups. So this goes into the average weighted by a quarter, and this is weighted by a quarter. These individually are actually weighted by a twelfth. So the subsets now are weighted in a very particular way, such that each subset size is equally likely. And so the first problem that I see is with this. This weighting, one-fourth, one-twelfth, one-quarter, for this, for a tree of size four, uh, has no biological justification that I can see. So the Shapley value, which is the fair proportion value, which the, the London Zoo calls the, uh, and many people call the ED, or evolutionarily distinct value, um, is easy to measure, but I don't see how it directly relates to conservation. 
And that's that first gap that's in the title. Of course, we can we don't have to use the Shapley value. We can define other sets that a, that a leaf can complement. Uh, for instance, we could say, well, how does it complement the, ex the the fictitious expected PD tree? So if we have some probabilities of extinction, we can produce that EPD tree, and we can actually speak of the complementarity of a species to the expected PD tree. Um, that so expected PD complementarity of a species is just the expected PD if you save the species minus so it's on the tree versus the expected PD if you lose the species. So that's the increase in expected PD if you make sure something's saved versus if it were to go extinct. That uh, Mike Steele and uh, myself and some students christened heightened evolutionary distinctness back in 2007 be because um, evolutionary distinctness was, was, had just been um, promulgated by the London Zoo. Um, this particular formulation is, is, is one that uh, Dan Faith came up with. Um, ours is much more complicated. And uh, Dan returns to this formulation of expected PD complementarity um, in a recent 2015 paper uh, in the context of a, yet another measure, which he calls ledge. So this idea um, is also in the literature. Unfortunately, I maintain, the expected PD tree, which comes from these probabilities of extinction upon which you calculate this complementarity value, is entirely fictitious. There is no good way I can see of calculating or estimating these probabilities of extinction. They're not static, for instance. Um, they depend on what time frame you look. Uh, is it, do you look over 20 years or 50 years or 100 years? If you do, these probabilities of extinction uh, change, and therefore your expected PD tree changes, and therefore your complement uh, measures will change. So I don't think there's a biological argument yet for an expected PD complementarity isolation method, measure. But really, I haven't even, I remember I just said, I dropped evolutionary isolation um, into the conversation without any real justification. And um, there's a good argument for not bothering with isolation whatsoever. And that's because evol evolutionary isolation, be it the Shapley or some other, talks about individual species, but doesn't explicitly consider complementarity of those species. So each species can have high complementarity. But sets of species may not have high complementarity. And this uh, was argued um, quite uh, strenuously by Faith back in 2008 when he saw that the London Zoo was starting to um, push for using isolation measures in conservation. So for instance, C and D individually are the two highest uh, uh, FP species on this tree. But because they share this internal branch, if you were to choose two species to capture most of the tree, you would choose C or D probably, uh, and then something from the other side of the tree, right? So even though these guys don't score highest in FP, they would score highest in a set that's trying to, to um, maximize PD if that's your goal. So how does that work out in practice? So um, we actually looked at this. So um, we looked at endangered birds. Uh, we built a, spe a, a tree or a set of trees uh, in 2012 and updated it in, in uh, 2014 um, of all trees and of oh, sorry of all birds all 9,993 that's, that's the number that we uh, used and uh, this is just a wheelogram one wheel a wheelogram of one of those trees and the the tips and magically the internal branches are, are colored by their FP score so by their PD complementarity in the shapely uh, context. And so species that are on short tips are cold, don't contribute much. Uh, species that are on long tips or don't have close relatives contribute quite a bit. And then we looked at just the ones that were endangered. So that all the ones that have colors around the edge are uh, imperiled as considered by the IUCN. So the entire tree is about 77 billion years on average uh, of evolutionary history. This is, this is a, a dated tree, in fact. Um, and if you just looked at the imperiled species, they collectively contribute about 2.7 billion years to that um, total, i.e. if we lost them. And then we used a greedy algorithm. So remember we said that the, that, that 
um, isolated species may not be complementary. So we said, okay, if we take the most isolated species, right, like the Hoatzin, actually the Hoatzin's not uh, endangered, so it wouldn't be in this list. Um, and then we take the second most uh, endangered isolated species, and the third, and the fourth, and the, and the fifth, up to 575, we can say, well, if we only save that one and all the others go extinct, how much extra PD do we get? And if we save two, how much PD do we get? And if we save 200, how much PD do we get? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to saving all of them and getting the 2.7 billion years back. Um, if we just chose them randomly, this is the sort of, we get sort of a linear increase between the number of species saved and the amount of tree uh, that um, we're conserving. If we use this Shapley value, we actually, which is the red line here, we actually get something that's very close to the, to the best possible subsets we could choose. So instead of choosing the first and the second and third, we would choose the one that gave us the most, and then we go back and choose the two that would give us the most, and the hundred that would give us the most. And that hundred, it doesn't have to be um, um, a subset or a continuation of the 99, for instance, it can be a completely different set. So this is the best possible, and we find that, the, that the, these two are quite close. And all these squiggly lines uh, refer to different trees that we did this on since we had many, many trees. And this is just another measure uh, that includes um, the range sizes, which will come up um, in the second or third uh, talk in this series. So this is with uh, uh, my colleagues Walter Yetz and Gavin Thomas and Klaus Hartmann and, and uh, Jeff Joy. And this showed that in this particular case, even though FP wasn't designed to be complementary, it seems to be doing a pretty good job. Now for this to be the case, we have to be in a situation where very isolated species that score high are not close relatives to other uh, very isolated species. I.e., you can't, it's not common to have two species that themselves are very isolated because they're on a very long branch, right? So they have a lot of history. This is just divided by two between these two. Um, and yet themselves uh, are closely related to each other such that they share this long branch. And so one question that I've asked people like Helene Morlon and others um, is what sort of diversification model would preclude this kind of situation? Because we know we see it in, in um, nature. So the, the tailed frogs, for instance, uh, uh, and the, the related frogs on New Ze uh, four related frogs in New Zealand are sister to all other frogs, supposedly, um, if, if you believe the Pyron and Weens tree. And so we do have a situation where we have some very isolated uh, species that themselves are closely related. And so um, why this is the case and whether this is expected or unexpected uh, in mac from macroevolutionary theory, I think it's an open question. Okay, now one can produce indices that lead to optimally uh, complementary sets. In fact, Evelyn Jensen is doing her PhD uh, at UBC. She was work she's been working um, on the Galapagos tortoises. I don't think that is a Galapagos tortoise. Uh, and she was calculating um, is isolation indices to see which of the populations and species of Galapagos tortoises might be contributing most to the collective. And she realized that those indices were not giving her true complementarity. And she said, well, that's no good. And so she actually calculated an iterative measure of uh, ED complementarity. And she just calculated, so this heightened evolutionary distinctness, so the expected complementarity if you save a, a species uh, versus if you don't. Then, as soon, then she found, found the species with the highest value. She said, that's the best one. And then she said, okay, I have saved that one. So I go, so then she went back and she changed the probability of extinction of that species to so make sure that it's saved. That produces a new expected PD tree from which you can then go and calculate HED again. So you can iteratively get a set that, that if you save them in that order will give you the maximum sort of bang for your buck, the maximum uh, PD. And she even named this measure uh, IHED, and uh, we have that paper um, in review now. Uh, as an aside, that was actually done on networks, not done on trees, but this can be done on trees just as easily. So one can do this. And this, I think, is the first time anyone's actually um, gone and done it, even though everyone's talked about it um, for a long time. Now, I've talked about one particular uh, or two particular isolation measures. There are, in fact, many, 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 many of them are the same thing with different names. Uh, some of them are the same, are different things with the same name. Uh, and it is, in fact, an entire big uh, rat's nest. And here are just some of the people that have contributed 
isolation measures. I'm missing all of the co-authors of all of these papers. And I'm definitely missing folks um, who have contributed to these and to others. But that's kind of the whole point of this slide, is to point out that there are many, many isolation measures. Very few of them make explicit connection to complementarity. Obviously, the score you use act matters. So this is something Dave Redding uh, and I have done. And uh, well, it's from Dave's thesis, actually. And um, basically, for mammals and amphibians, the two uh, groups for which at, this, at that time we had uh, edge scores, we could calculate edge scores. We found that ED and, and the shapely value give you the same. But if you use other measures of isolation, the number of species that, that are in the top 100 can, in fact, be quite different from the one that actually, has actually been uh, published. Remember? And I said, I don't know why this one's being used. Um, but I don't know why you would use any of these others either, because none of them are, are tied back to anything that we actually want to um, preserve, at least empirically, and for most of them, not even theoretically. So it really matters which ones you use. So, I think one, another open question that somebody should, should uh, really take seriously is to ask which isolation measures best captures, so which measures capture should be, that should have a bracket around it, feature diversity, or PD. And I should point out that Florent Mazel at Grenoble and Sandrine Pavouin and colleagues have actually started in a slightly different context to organize all of these isolation measures, or some of them. Um, and it's an appendix to a paper that's uh, um, in revision right now with biological reviews. Um, but they didn't focus on isolation per se. So there's much more work to be done here. But this question is actually a higher order question, if that's the right way to say it. Because really, in order to figure that out, we have to figure out how trees even represent uh, feature diversity. So um, this is, I don't think, um, moving into Sandrine Pavouin's territory, she's giving the talk uh, in a couple months. But I just want to point out that there are some models of change of traits on trees uh, such that if the traits evolve that way, um, PD actually does capture, capture feature diversity. And that if you have many features that are independently evolving under Brownian motion. But that, I think, is the only model I know where PD is guaranteed to give you maximum feature diversity. Um, one can transform the tree if you actually believe that edges near the root contain more information about feature diversity than edges near the tips. And you can, can, you can actually transform the tree. And there are different ways of, that you can transform it. One, this one, can, one is an early burst transform, which is common in uh, adaptive radiations. Um, there's the um, single stationary peak, or the OU transform. That's where you think that most of the interesting evolution is happening near the, that's relevant, is happening near the tips. And so you make these edges longer so they contribute more to PD. Uh, and the, these simple models um, allow you to, to, to think about how variation is distributed across the tree. Um, so there's the actual tree, and then there's tipper transformations or rootward, rootward transformations. And, we, and if you have the data, if you already have the data, like uh, Luke Harmon and colleagues uh, collected for body size for a whole bunch of groups, um, then you can ask how that, those data evolve on the tree. And you can transform the tree. And then, of course, you could do the PD calculations on that tree. But of course, that's kind of daft, because you already have the data that you're interested in. So why would you want to look at a tree at all? So you can raise, you can do transformations to any particular tree to get different looking trees. Um, but we wouldn't know what that uh, uh, transformation would be unless you actually had the data. And indeed, the general case, which is an additive tree, looks like this, to transform the actual phylogeny, which is, which is measured in time, to some sort of tree where that branch lengths actually represent feature diversity um, seems to be completely idiosyncratic, and therefore very difficult to do with just the tree. Now, interestingly, and I'm almost at the end of my talk here, um, in macroevolution, these transformations are akin to different weightings of edges that are near the tips versus edges that are near the root. And it turns out that you can um, consider 
some all isolation, all isolation measures, but we only looked at a few of them, and ask, well, how much do they weight information near the tips, so the pendant edge? All the information is at the tip. It's only that tip length that counts. You don't even count anything below it, versus something like the average pairwise distance, which is, as it's named, simply the patristic distance of a species to all other species on the tree, um, because it crosses those deeper branches many times, is actually weighted towards internal branches. Interestingly, in ecology, the average pairwise distance is called originality. And the, pair, and the pendant edge is very close to uh, the nearest neighbor distance. And in ecology, this re is referred to as uniqueness. I should point out that um, there is an evolutionary isolation measure, which people also refer to as originality. But it's not this one. It's actually this one um, that Centurion Pev 1 presented back in 2005. So to the extent that that is true, then we can ask, for instance, and of course we'll have all these other isolation measures somewhere along this continuum, I would assume, um, that some, measure, some measures of isolation are concerned with originality, and some measures are concerned with uniqueness. And then the question becomes, well, which one are we trying to conserve? Or is, should we be how should we be balancing those two? I uh, make the um, prediction based on no data whatsoever that measures like the average pairwise distance may, so this is the, this is the pr prediction, um, may be more related to the ecosystem properties uh, that Mark Kadot um, has been studying, amongst others, whereas species uniqueness may be a better measure of option value, i.e., those features that are not found anywhere else. And so those two reasons for conserving feature diversity may, I have no idea whether it's true, but may actually be encapsulated by two very different measures of isolation. So if we go back to that quote, that the underlying feature diversity of taxon subsets can be predicted by the phylogenetic relationships among the taxa, that, so I can say all I want about things like this, but this, of course, is predi still predicated so that's why I said that, that my, my question about isolation um, is also cart before the horse, is still predicated on this. And when papers like this come out by Richard Gagne, uh, uh, Robert Scotland, and Stephen Kelly that have titles like Phylogenetic Trees Do Not Reliably Predict Feature Diversity, then I think we really do have to um, move back a couple of steps. And that is, I think, we have to turn the horse around uh, and put the cart behind it and go back, before we talk about which isolation measures are important, go back and try to figure out how the tree and when the tree actually captures diversity that we're interested in for conservation, um, such that PD is a useful measure. And then we can start talking about things like PD complementarity and expected PD complementarity. And I think that will be the talk by Sandrine Pavouin on December 8th at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And so I very much look forward to her talk so she can straighten me out on all these things. And Eric, that is the end of the seminar. Excellent. That was a, a very clear and very interesting talk. Um, I, I think it was opinionated indeed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I am surprised that this is the, as, as you described. So what sorts of, um, like, if, if you could formulate some sort of model of accumulation of traits on a phylogenetic tree, of interesting traits, uh, what, what would it look like that, you know, something that you would want to preserve. So there, yeah, so there are two issues. One, I think there, there are two issues there. One is um, empirically, how do traits sit on trees? I think that's, I think that's perhaps the more important uh, question. And I think that's what maybe what Sandrine's going to talk about. Uh, and then the other side is, well, what if we have a bunch of reasonable models that we think are reasonable a priori, um, 
how are traits distributed across the tips under those reasonable models, and then which uh, isolation measures would be best capture the total feature diversity if you use them in the sorts of ways that I uh, outlined with um, using this idea of complementarity and, uh, and rarity. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, I, uh, I, I haven't had time to read that paper you just described about phylogenetic trees do not uh, reliably predict feature diversity. So I will look forward to, to reading that. But I mean, w what is their basic point? Do you mind? So that um, paper, if, if I go back, I, I can go back and uh, I think I have a couple of slides on it. Uh, So the question is, what is in that uh, paper that I uh, mentioned right at the end? Um, this paper. Mm. Um, and they actually, this was an empirical study. So they went to um, TreeBase, and they downloaded a whole bunch of trees and a whole bunch of data sets. And they simply asked, well, what does it look like? And so and so what they uh, compared was the distance between particular species and how many features that were shared between those two, um, uh, any set of any pair of species. So if the patristic distance, so the distance along the tree, predicts feature diversity, then you would get a high uh, R squared between the branch length distance and the number of shared, shared features. Um, and, but what they actually found was looked more like this. So species that were very closely related to each other did share a lot of features. But species that were more distant on the tree, so for instance, crossing the root, you know, on either side of the root, basically were more, no more uh, uh, different than what you'd expect if it was just a random draw. And that's just saturation. This is for uh, morphological characters, but a whole bunch of morphological characters, right? This was just, these are just data sets pulled down um, from tree base. But to the extent that this is true, then you certainly wouldn't want to wait deep branches in your measure of isolation, you'd only want to weight uh, shallow branches um, because that's where you get information about shared and perhaps uh, uh, the flip side, um, un un features that are not shared. So uh, again, this is empirical and there are, you know, this is just standard saturation that we know from molecular father genetics. And the idea being is that it also holds for morphological characters. Yeah, I mean, as you've been describing this, I sort of, it sort of starts me thinking about the fact that most of the tree-based trees are built on marker genes and so on, and you sort of wonder if we did something with more of a whole, phen whole genome notion of phylogeny, if that would change this. Yes, so this, this is very much model-based in terms of how you, uh, uh, how you construct your trees. Most of the trees, and um, I can be corrected if I'm wrong, most of the trees in this database are, in fact, morphological trees. Uh, they, and they, re, they took the data sets and they recreated uh, uh, the trees to get a tree that fits the data as, as, as well as they could uh, using a gamma model, I think. It was just a MK model with gamma, I think, to, um, to, to reproduce those trees to give it the best chance of getting a high correlation between how, how related you are, uh, sorry, how related you are patristically and the features that you might share. And they still get a lot of saturation. But this is early days, so I, I, I'm not claiming that this um, sort of negates the entire PD conservation uh, connection, but I, th I think it, it does point out that we need to do a lot more work, both empirically and with our models. Absolutely. I mean, though I do, yeah, it would be interesting to see what the result of doing like a doing a comparison of molecular phylogenetic distances, because yeah, I mean, it seems possible that you would be able to get at deeper branches. Yes. So, um, yes, they didn't. They, they they have a couple of examples of where they actually tried to fit the morphological data to the molecular tree, um, uh, but they don't have enough. They didn't have enough data to do that for uh, all of the groups. Yeah. Any case, uh, should I plop that out? Or people want to keep looking at that. Oh, that's uh, that's good for me. Okay. All right. So, are the um, are the edge like? What is the interaction like with edge and other such groups? Uh, sorry, what like, is the interaction with? 
Yeah, I mean, so like there's, you know, people are coming up with different ideas about these different metrics, and are, mm -hmm. are, are they sticking with their one that? So, oh, well, I don't want to speak for um, the Zoological Society, but they uh, in the, have been open to using different measures. Um, they basically, I, I, my understanding is they want our community to figure out which is the one that's best and then, and then to use it. And so um, they have talked about using uh, expected PD complementarity. So that takes into account the extinction probabilities of other species so that they try to deal with the, this idea of, of getting small groups, trying to conserve small groups that all share uh, deep branches. Um, but until, until the community sort of gets together and, and decides what to do with this, this ridiculous number of isolation measures and try to figure out what they actually measure, I think they're just going to wait. Yeah. And which, which I think is a perfectly uh, reasonable thing to do. Yeah. Um. I really like that thing at the beginning with the different subsets because you can imagine there being uh, like certain areas that contain certain species and so on, and so you're sort of optimizing on the level of areas versus uh, individual species. But then I didn't hear a whole lot more about it for the rest of the talk. Is that still being incorporated into the rest of the framework that you described? Right. So, so the original uh, PD framework was a, a place-based framework, really, because that's how conservation generally uh, is done. And absolutely, the, the, the question you asked was, well, are people still doing that? And, I, and of, of course they are um, in, the, in academia. Now, the, the reason that evolutionary isolation, for some reason, has caught on is because it seems that, and I may be wrong again, but it seems that it is easier to implement. For some reason, because it's attached to a particular species, and we're used to particular species having particular attributes, like being at risk or not being at risk, the idea of attaching an isolation measure to a species um, seems to be easier than sort of MP hard problems for choosing amongst a bunch of conservation areas. Because, and again, I'm happy to be, to be, to be told that this is no longer the case, um, conservation biologists will say, well, that's not really what happens. We don't get a whole set. It's very rare that we get a, a big map and we say, okay, here are all the possibilities. You get to choose um, three of these 12 possibilities. So if we can do that, then we should do that. Uh, evolution isolation is then just a sort of a heuristic that might help us do that, but it's, it wouldn't be the ideal way to do it. And I think that's the idiosyncratic portion of this talk, is that I was focusing on evolution isolation because that is what a lot of people talk about. You know, like you go to talks and people have, from the IUCN, and they're, they're all thinking, well, what can we do with this evolutionary isolation measure? Um, and, you know, the, the London Zoo is actually actively getting money to do it. And so I'm like, okay, well, hold on. We've got to figure out, how, we, we still have to figure out how to do it. Okay. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's an interesting optimization problem because you have to sort of select your problem both on you know, what is, a, what is the most appropriate thing to conserve, but then also what is the most appropriate thing to use for attracting attention to the problem. Exactly, exactly. And, and I, you know, I would not be unhappy if, if evolution isolation was simply dropped and we went back to a, a, the, a proper uh, uh, place-based optimization scheme, which would take us right back to Wainwright and, and Faith from the 90s. Uh, because that, you know, we still have to deal with, with how, what, how PD captures feature diversity and why we use PD, but, it, but it, it gets rid of that extra layer of sort of assumption on top of it. So, um, but we'll see, how we're, we'll see how things play out. I, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm continually surprised at how much uh, interest there is in this idea of evolutionary isolation. And uh, that's why I'm just calling for more for more hard thinking about it so that as a community we can we can agree on on what it does and which one we should use. That's cool. Yeah, I mean it I it's you've made a great advertisement for Sandrine's talk, so I'll do All right. Well that's that was that was the idea, right? And then uh, Catherine's actually gonna look at put it on the landscape. So how do you put trees on the landscape, which is getting to this idea of optimization. So uh, right. we'll, we'll we'll see what she says about that. Yeah. Okay? Excellent. Well, uh, thank you very much, Arna. Uh, you'll have to imagine all the applause going around from. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, 
Um, It'll get posted. That was a very, yeah, very interesting and very good talk. Okay, dokie. So should we sign off?